As our society becomes more urbanized, the value of using animals in the classroom becomes more apparent. They provide lessons on matters of science, allowing students to capture skills in observation and critical thinking, as well as animal care. Also, they nurture intellectual curiosity, self-esteem, and respect for other living beings. But the value of animals as a teaching tool must be balanced against potential risks to students and animals. The purpose of this videotape is to help train classroom teachers on the proper handling, husbandry, nutrition, and health care of the classroom pet and the prevention of zoonotic disease transmission. This tape is not meant to be a standalone educational unit. It must be used in conjunction with the teaching manual, which has much more detailed information on all of the topics discussed in this tape. We strongly recommend utilizing a veterinarian to facilitate this training, such as the Oklahoma Veterinary Medical Association's Adopt-a-School Veterinarian or another veterinarian in your community to provide additional information and to answer your questions. More information on this OVMA program is in your manual. Because of the tremendous importance of animals in the classroom, Oklahoma State University's College of Veterinary Medicine, the Kirkpatrick Foundation, and the Oklahoma Veterinary Medical Foundation have joined together to produce this training program. In this tape, we'll look at special considerations regarding animals in the classroom the needs of the visiting and residential pets, and some public health precautions. You may watch the tape in its entirety, or you may choose to watch a portion, then refer to the teaching manual, then return to the tape for another segment. The choices are completely yours. But before we get started, let's hear from some teachers who have experience with animals in their classrooms. First, it kind of adds a little bit of comfort to the classroom. Uh, just having some, some pets and animals in there that the kids can kind of relate to. I was looking through pictures last night of my children in my classroom of the very first day of school and, and many of them were gathered around by the guinea pig, petting the guinea pig, and that was an instant attraction for the kids that come into my room, um, are very drawn to animals. And so um, besides learning about the care and the responsibility of taking care of an animal, I think just having an animal in the classroom um, makes your classroom kind of a sense of just a caring a caring environment. It's kind of shown that uh, kids who have things in their hand also uh, stimulates their learning environment, can simulate the, the way that they can respond to questions and so a lot of times we'll have the pets in the hands when teaching in the classroom so that it can stimulate that thinking. It's really easy fourth grade just because um, one of the curriculums that the fourth grade must teach is animal studies so we have to learn about, you know, animal classification, habitats, environments, similarities, differences, things like that. But I've also seen my children um, observing the guinea pig and learning about its habits and, and when it does certain things. And so they're very quick to recognize its needs. Um, you know, if they hear it squealing, then they know that it must be out of water. No, I think it makes a very pleasant environment to where um, it's one of the key um, motivational things that I do in my classroom. Well, there are two key areas that we want to focus on that teachers should be screening their students for. One is for the presence of any immunosuppressive conditions. That may be a child who is perhaps has leukemia, who is on chemotherapy, or may be very asthmatic and is on high doses of prednisone or other corticosteroid medications. Or we also have some children that are infected with HIV virus and need to be monitored closely. Those children would be extremely susceptible to any zoonotic infections and should be restricted from have being, uh, having any close physical contact with animals. And those are probably classrooms that should not have a residential pet. 
Before a teacher purchases a pet for the classroom, it's important that they consult with a veterinarian so that they can get advice on the proper housing and what items need to be purchased um, to fill the cage, what diets are appropriate, and what the age and the sex of the animal might be preferred in the classroom, and any of the health concerns, part, um, what to look for to pick a healthy pet. And, um, and so it's really a good idea that the teacher speaks with a veterinarian in person to get some advice before they actually purchase the animal. Uh, just as people have different dogs and they match a family appropriately, each of these animals have very different personalities and care requirements. And so it's also a good idea that a teacher and a veterinarian speak about a good fit and a good match for the age of the children and the amount of time that can be devoted to caring for the animal because some animals are high maintenance and some animals are low maintenance. And uh, trying to get a good fit so that the children are happy and that um, the animal can be cared for easily. So as soon as an animal is purchased, it's important that it gets an exam right away, just as when you get a puppy and a kitten, it goes right to the veterinarian. And what the vet will do is look for, uh, do a full physical exam and look for any underlying health problems in that individual animal. And it's also the time that a fecal exam is done for any parasites and that ferrets get vaccinated and that birds have a blood test for chlamydia or psittacosis. Some of our primary concerns have to deal with enteric pathogens, um, that is bacteria or par uh, protozoal parasites or viruses that could be present in the animal's stool um, or possibly on the surface of the animal, um, that contamination coming from them rolling around in their own waste. Um, a key one of the enteric pathogens that we're concerned about with classroom pets is salmonella because salmonella is very widespread in nature and almost every animal on the planet is capable of being um, infected with salmonella. We have a special concern with the baby chicks and the eggshell projects because of a type of salmonella called salmonella enteritidis. Salmonella enteritidis is actually present in the bird's ovary and so this bacteria is incorporated within the egg when it is laid and therefore baby chicks are and can be in as soon as they're hatched or eggshell fragments that have not been autoclaved or appropriately disinfected are potentially infectious to children who may be handling those pieces of raw eggshell. And so therefore we are limiting the handling of chicks and those eggshells to older children and projects that would involve incubating eggs and watching the baby chicks hatch should be observation only. Those are a particular concern because surveys have shown that almost 90% of reptiles and amphibians are colonized with salmonella bacteria. And for that reason, we strongly recommend that reptiles and amphibians not be kept as pets in elementary classrooms. There is an exception to that, and that is the uh, science modules that include the tadpole projects, those are observation only, but those uh, are approved for classes K through 12, and teachers should refer to that section in their manual that covers that exception. So therefore, <clears throat> children need to take basic hygienic precautions with um, handling animals that may be contaminated with salmonella, and these go back to those things that are mentioned in the manual of only allowing children over the age of 10 to assist with cleaning cages or aquariums, wearing vinyl gloves when they do so, and then after they've completed that procedure of following excellent hand washing technique afterwards. And I'm sure all of the teachers are aware of the key points there, that the children are using running water and soap that they're washing their hands for at least 15 to 20 seconds and that they are trained to wash on all aspects of their fingers and up to the forearm and then point their hands downward so that the water and the soap and also any pathogens that are on their hands are flowing into the sink. Um, next is when emptying any food bowls or water bowls or emptying aquariums or cages that that not be done in an area where there are any food items in that immediate vicinity. They want to avoid splashing because there are some of these bacteria or viruses that could be transmitted to persons from the animal that could actually be aerosolized. So they should avoid splashing. And then after emptying and cleaning, 
to rinse and disinfect that area, the sink and the surrounding countertop. If it is available, um, it is preferred for doing a thorough rinsing of aquariums and cages and items that have quite a bit of fecal contamination on them, if that can be done maybe at a hose or a sink outside of the classroom. Those are anything that would be considered venomous or wildlife. Um, we particularly want to point out to teachers that it's not an uncommon event for children to find injured or orphaned wildlife on school grounds or they may find them at home and bring them to the school hoping to include them in a uh, uh, you know, show and tell type of setting and that is something we would certainly frown on because there's some very great hazard there potentially. At the health department <clears throat> I've experienced situations where Children have bought, brought a bat into the classroom for show and tell and have it in an open container where some of the children are handling it and then later the bat is submitted to our rabies laboratory for testing and have it come up positive. And you can imagine there's a great deal of anxiety and concern as we have to go through with each of the individual children and assess the need for rabies post-exposure immunizations. So really under no circumstances should wildlife be allowed in the classroom unless it is with a trained wildlife rehabilitator or scientist where you have this as a scheduled educational program. Sometimes pets may visit a classroom for a specific educational event such as a pet day or a show and tell. In this case it's important that any visiting pet be well groomed, current on appropriate vaccinations and free of internal and external parasites. According to Oklahoma law Dogs, cats, and ferrets must be current on rabies vaccination. The visiting pet should also be properly restrained and restricted to a designated area of the school campus or classroom. It's important for the safety of both the children and the animal that the pet be effectively controlled. Animals away from their normal environments may become frightened and react strangely in a classroom setting. Appropriate restraint will allow the holder to react quickly and minimize any potential harm to the students or animal. The animal owner or other responsible adult should remain with the animal during the pet's entire visit to the school. Your manual has more information on health and handling requirements for specific animals as well as necessary approval forms for the visiting pet. When it comes to caring for the resident pet in the classroom, there are five main focus areas. Housing, nutrition, exercise, grooming, and health care. With limited space in a classroom, it can be difficult to, uh, to find an appropriate size cage. That's why it's important to know if the animal needs more of a high, uh, tall cage or if they need a more long cage. And so each species has different cage requirements um, that can uh, dictate what type of cage they need. Guinea pigs and rabbits need more ground space than height. Uh, that's what they naturally do in the wild. They cover a lot of area on the ground. So it's best to have uh, the largest cage possible. And sometimes you can have pens for them, whether it's a dog pen in the corner or a child's uh, kiddie pool, in order for these guinea pigs to run around, because they do like to run in circles a lot. Um, and animals such as chinchillas need more height and birds. And so you want to have different levels in their cage, at least two or three different levels for those animals. And small rodents such as mice and gerbils and hamsters um, are some of the best classroom pets because you can have a fairly large cage for them, but it fits well in a room. Um, with those types of animals, you just need different levels as well so they can climb around and hop around. Lizards are, are very common pets, such as iguanas and anoles, and uh, their basic housing would be a cage that has ample space. And many times a homemade cage will uh, be the best type of thing because aquariums sometimes can be too small for iguanas. So you want to have a cage where they have different climbing levels. And the most important thing that is essential to keep them healthy is that they need to have a certain heat um, requirement certain type of lighting that mimics the sun, and a very specialized diet that is supplemented every day. So it is really important that any uh, pet lizard goes to the veterinarian and gets an exam and gets lots of um, details about how to properly house them. A 
Unfortunately, there's a lot of um, poor information uh, out there that, and a lot of products that are not healthy for the animal. So it's really important to be educated and know what is best for these animals to avoid health problems. And what, one of the most important things is the bedding. Aspen chips or shavings are the most healthy bedding you can have because if you use pine or cedar, it can actually make the animal sick. And the most highly available sh uh, shaving is pine, and it does cause a lot of medical problems. So I emphasize that you need to get aspen uh, pellets or shavings to keep the animals healthy. And that's a nice absorbent bedding you can put on the bottom of the cage. And then all of these animals need at least one house or hide box, um, depending on what they naturally do in the wild. For example, mice and hamsters need homes, and you can have little bird nests, or they make little houses for them. You can ha get plastic houses and even cardboard boxes and cut little windows and doors in them. But they need at least two or more little hiding areas to sleep in because they actually sleep during the day and are awake at night. Um, the most important thing about toys is to make sure they're safe. For example, ferrets love to eat foam and rubber and if you give them a soft rubber dog toy they can actually eat it and it can get stuck inside of them and if you give them a soft toy for a dog they can get the foam out of it and eat it and get stuck much more than a, a dog could so it's really important that you get a ferret safe toy that's a hard plastic or hard rubber that they can't tear apart and then the other thing that's very, very important as far as toys that cause problems are bird toys. More than half of the bird toys sold have got a toxic metal in it. It's zinc or galvanized metal, and some of them have copper bells. And all of those types of metals are very hazardous to the birds, even if they just play and mouth it. So it's important when you're selecting bird toys to make sure it has hard wood and it's got plastic and hard rubber, but that the metal holding it together is stainless steel, a very shiny stainless steel, and then it's safe. For rabbits and rodents, they gnaw all the time and their teeth grow all the time. And so it's very impor important to give them a hard wood to gnaw on. However, pine and cedar and oak and all those types of woods are not safe. So the most safe wood would be willow trees, mulberry trees, and any kind of fruit tree. They all actually have different flavors and textures. And so what needs to be done is that you cut some branches from a tree that's never been sprayed with pesticides or call a tree trimmer and get leftover branches. I've done that before. And then I use cable ties to cinch them in so you're actually creating a little uh, shrub in their cage. And for the birds, you use them as perches and create a little tree-like area. You can leave the leaves on them. And all these rabbits, rodents, and the birds who naturally chew wood in the wild will just demolish all of these little wood pieces you put in. And it will either wear down their beak or wear down their teeth. And that's a very important, healthy thing to do. And then you, it also replaces buying toys every week that they destroy and crumble up. If you just have a lot of branches in there, then that, that um, feeds their sensation to gnaw constantly. The most important thing about watering is that many of these animals are very messy and if you give them a bowl of water they will put their food in the water and they'll get soiled pretty quickly and bacteria can grow and they, they could get sick. So sipper bottles are usually the best thing for rodents and rabbits and ferrets um, and with birds the biggest thing is you have to put the water dish higher than the food dish so that they don't drop the food into the water. So if your water dish is above the food dish then it stays fairly clean and it does need to be changed every day. Another important fact about birds is um, that with their diet, they really need to have a very, very, varied diet, but they get bored pretty easily. Uh, most birds are very intelligent birds, and so you can offer their food in puzzle toys. And there are many toys available that they have to work to get their food out, and it keeps them busy, because an average bird will take one piece and then throw it. And if they have it in these little toys, like skewer, you can skewer the food or put it in a little carousel where they have to work at it. That'll keep them busy um, for half of a day as they're eating, is what they normally do. They'll just kind of eat all through the day. We recommend for rabbits and ferrets uh, trying to train them to a litter box because naturally they will prefer to go to the bathroom in a corner. So if you get a corner shaped litter box that are made for these animals with a very low front and they can easily get into it because of that. Now the type of litter um, that is preferred would be a pressed pellet paper um, or a um, aspen pellet. 
and that way those are not irritating, they're very absorbent. Um, sometimes with some kitty litters, they have a lot of odors to them and they can stick to the animal's face and paws and then they can ingest that and that's not very good. So we recommend to use uh, paper pellets or aspen pellets. Um, aquariums, um, the most important thing is the filter because they need to have a, uh, a good filter that has been actually primed before the fish is put in and um, the, the tank needs to be cleaned on usually a weekly basis where you remove part of the water and then add in some new water and if it's um, not well water it needs to be dechlorinated each time. Each species has, a, has very different requirements for a healthy diet, and so we need to look at each species individually and recommend what their balanced diet would be to keep them healthy. And unfortunately, there are many, many uh, problems and diseases that result from a poor diet, and so it is important to go through each diet and make recommendations. Um, with the process pellets, whether they're bird pellets or rabbit pellets or ferret pellets, a lot of times they, um, they're the most fragile nutrients will um, go away with heat and time. So the way to um, preserve the food is to get small quantities, keep them in sealed containers like a Tupperware container and store it in the refrigerator. And that way you'll save most of your nutrients. And they even have plastic uh, cereal containers that you can easily pour. And that's a good recommendation for a lot of these pellets. Um, the gerbils, hamsters, mice, and rats can all eat the same diet, and that is a very balanced rodent pellet. Now, the problem with that is they don't usually enjoy the pellets very much. So a trick is they come in very large pieces. It's just a, um, crush it with a hammer into tiny pieces and mix it in with a healthy um, seed and dried fruit mix so that they will eat all of that, and that's a good way to get them to eat. Guinea pigs are unusual in that they have extremely high requirement for vitamin C. And um, unfortunately, the pellets that are processed, um, the vitamin C doesn't last very long in those. So you never know if your pellets are fully giving them the vitamin C they need. So it's essential that every guinea pig gets an additional source of vitamin C each day. And there are two methods of doing that. One, that it can be fun for the animal, is to every day just give them a small piece of a high vitamin C vegetable or fruit. And the examples of those are bell peppers, any color is extremely high in vitamin C and just a tiny slice will do, or a piece of kale, which is a dark leafy green vegetable that you can give them, or kiwi. Those are all very high in vitamin C and a small amount will meet their needs. The second way to do it would be to give a formulated vitamin C pellet. They make them for people and they make them for guinea pigs. It's really important to only give them vitamin C and not a multivitamin mineral tablet. And um, for example, you can get sun-kissed chewable vitamin C and just give them a quarter for an average guinea pig. But it is important to get uh, a veterinarian's advice about how to dose these animals. Uh, most of these guinea pigs will um, enjoy the orange or apple flavored uh, vitamin C tablet and just take it every day as a treat. Rabbits, um, we have learned, have got different nutritional requirements than we thought. We used to feed them mostly alfalfa, and now we've learned that that causes many health problems, such as hairballs and uh, bladder and kidney disease. So these days, it's very important to have them on an all-Timothy-based diet, and that would be a Timothy-based pellet in Timothy hay or another coarse hay, such as oat hay, uh, prairie hay, and orchard hay. Half of their diet should be hay, or even more than half their diet should be hay, and that helps prevent hairballs. And then the pellet should be a good quality pellet. But even on this diet, they still can have um, intestinal problems. So in order to prevent hairballs, especially when rabbits are losing their hair and molting, it's important to give them a papaya or pineapple enzyme every day. And the way to do that would be just to get a fresh pineapple or fresh papaya and give that fruit a small amount each day. But that can be difficult in certain areas. So an easier way is just to get a tablet that is made for these rabbits. And it's a real delicious treat. And you give them a pineapple papaya tablet each day will help prevent hairballs.
Ferrets are strict carnivores and have the fastest um, intestinal tract of most animals, and so they need a really concentrated, high-protein diet. And we used to recommend cat food, but these days it's very important to just give them a high-quality ferret chow, and there are many good brands out there, and that's their main diet. Now, even though they're carnivores, ferrets love to eat dairy products and sweets, but that can make them pretty sick. So we say if you're going to give them a treat, give them a little meat treat or a cat treat or a ferret treat. When we talk about birds, most pets are in the parrot family, like a parakeet or a cockatiel, and their diet used to always be a seed mix. However, we've learned um, recently that they can as well get many health problems from being on an all-seed diet. The problem with birds is they love their seed diet and it can be extremely difficult and frustrating to get them to eat their pellets. So we recommend some tricks and their main diet should be an all-pelleted diet every day with some fresh vegetables that are high in vitamin A because these birds need more vitamin A than other animals. So every day they should get an orange colored vegetable such as sweet potato, carrots, or squash to meet those vitamin A nutrients. And, um, and they can have other types of food too. So the basic diet would be the pellets, vegetables and fruits, and you can give them a treat such as bread or rice or pasta or whatever the kids are eating that day. Um, an iguana's diet is uh, very strict. They need to have a high calcium green. Half of their diet should be a vegetable such as kale, collards, musta, mustard, turnip, or dandelion greens. And they should have several of those items in their diet each day to meet their calcium needs. And then they need to have vegetables that are high in vitamin A, such as um, carrots, sweet potato, and squashes, and then other high, highly nutritious vegetables. Um, at least a salad consisting of five to ten different vegetables and a couple fruits for flavor and treats. And that needs to be supplemented every day with the all calcium supplement and the salad needs to be supplemented once a week with a multivitamin mineral powder made for reptiles. Most fish just can have a processed flake diet. Um, you do want to store that in the refrigerator so it keeps its nutrients. And the most important thing about feeding fish is to not overfeed them. The children want to watch the fish feed until they're totally finished and only put in a couple flakes at a time. And if the fish finish eating, you need to scoop out the leftover food because that can make the quality of the water unhealthy for the fish. Um, the animals that really need a lot of exercise out in a room would be a ferret and a rabbit and guinea pigs. And they can be housed in their cages and sleep and enjoy their time in there, but every day they can be let out to run around. And rabbits and guinea pigs just like to run around a room, but ferrets like to have toys and tunnels. And you can get lots of tubes and tunnels for them to run through um, to keep them busy. And smaller animals, such as the hamsters, gerbils, and mice, do fine in their cage as long as they have an exercise wheel that they can run and run and run in that. Birds are very active animals, but in a classroom, it's usually not recommended to let them out of the cage. So try to get the largest cage possible so that the bird has plenty of room to flap around and stretch its wings and climb around the cage. Birds need to be groomed and um, every day and at least once a week they need to have a bath. You can give them either a shallow dish of water that they can bathe in, but many birds love to take a shower. If you get a spray bottle of uh, warm water and just lightly mist the bird, they will groom their feathers and, uh, and look brighter and cleaner. Birds also need to have their wings trimmed so that if they happen to get out, they can't fly away, and their nails trimmed when they get long. And if their beak overgrows, then you need to take them to a veterinarian so they can get it filed down. Ferrets sometimes can have a little musky smell to them, and so um, they do clean themselves like a cat would. However, you can bathe them when they start to get a little smelly. The most important thing is that you use a ferret shampoo, and they make deodorizing shampoos for ferrets. And if you happen to have a flea problem, they do make flea shampoos for ferrets as well. But it's very important that you use that and not a dog and cat product.
Uh, grooming for rabbits and rodents are very important to trim their nails. They overgrow pretty frequently and rabbits and rodents teeth grow constantly. They need to be checked by a veterinarian at least once a year because the back teeth can overgrow and make little spurs that could be difficult to eat, but the front teeth can overgrow as well and all of those can be trimmed. So it is very important that you find out if your rodent or rabbit has straight teeth or crooked teeth because crooked teeth can uh, need to be trimmed more frequently. Chinchilla's grooming needs are pretty unusual. Um, they need to groom in a dust uh, in a dust bath. And the way to provide that is to get a manufactured chinchilla dust and put them in a pan or a bowl and they will roll around and they actually groom out the dust that catches the oils. And so about once a week, and you can even do it every day, they need a, a dust bath. There are common health problems that can occur in any species. And if a teacher observes that the animal is not eating very well or is salivating, or they start to have problems going to the bathroom, either urine or feces, the animal starts to look thin or lose hair or feathers, then all of those can be a signs of problems, as well as sneezing and coughing. And uh, any general signs of illness usually are more important in an exotic pet that would be in a classroom than a dog or cat, because all of these species hide their illness naturally. And so if any signs of illness are observed, they should really go and uh, get checked out by the veterinarian. Yes, there are very common and specific problems for many of these species. For example, iguanas and lizards can commonly get metabolic bone disease if the heating, lighting, and diet are not in perfect balance, and that can happen pretty easily. And what you would notice is the animal starts to get weak and can't climb very much, and they start to tremble sometimes. And if you see that a uh, lizard is starting to look weak and not be as active, then it's important that he gets a checkup. The most common problem in guinea pigs is uh, scurvy from a lack of vitamin C. And so it's um, really important that their needs are met. But sometimes if their fur looks dry and they don't eat very much, it can be a sign of a vitamin C problem. Maybe the guinea pig's just not eating as much as he should. Gerbils, hamsters, rats, and mice very commonly get pneumonia, as well as guinea pigs. And so the most um, first sign of respiratory disease in these rodents, uh, they get little crusty uh, sections around their eyes and their nose, and they can have a runny nose. They don't sneeze and cough very much, but they can uh, just look tired and they're breathing heavier. And any signs of a runny nose in any of these animals is really important to get them checked for pneumonia. There are high frequency of gerbils that are born with epilepsy. And usually what precipitates it is a stressful crisis. So if a, an, a gerbil has a seizure, we usually don't treat them because it's very difficult to monitor their therapy, but just maybe not handle them or have them handled very quietly. So it's usually any kind of stress factor that precipitates a seizure. And many of them can live a very uh, ha healthy life if they're just not stressed. And an epileptic gerbil would need more hiding places, and sometimes we recommend covering three sides of the cage with a dark paper so you can only view them from the front. In general, every animal, despite what type of animal it is, should have a fecal exam for parasites. And um, that's, very, that's just general for every animal. The only animal that has a specific requirement would be ferrets. And they do need to be vaccinated against dog distemper. And they have a ferret vaccine, not a dog vaccine, for them. They also need to be on heartworm preventatives. And it is law that they are vaccinated, vaccinated with a rabies vaccine. The most common health problems we see in the species that are exotic are um, unfortunately related to housing and nutrition and uh, toys in their environment. So we really do need to learn as much as possible about the caging, the toys, the housing, and their diet to keep these pets healthy.
Unfortunately, there's not one good book out there for each species. And what we recommend is that each teacher will try to get a, a general book on them. There are magazines and there are videos and there's many different ways to get um, information from lots of different sources on the specific species to keep them healthy. And this is a growing medical field, so each year we learn more and more about their requirements for diet and housing. And so uh, annual checkups with a veterinarian um, that specializes in these species can be helpful because you can get updates in their health care. The most important thing to remember when handling the classroom pet is to be gentle, quiet, and never squeeze. If the animals are allowed into a play area, it needs to be pet proofed. Electrical cords and plugs need to be covered and cords need to be concealed so they can't have access to them. Holes need to be covered or filled. Children need to be aware to be careful not to step or sit on the animal, and small objects that the animals can choke on must be removed. Beyond that, children should be sitting when holding or playing with a pet. They should keep pets away from their faces, and they should never kiss pets. Although biting is rare, children need to be taught that if they are bitten, they should never throw an animal. As for handling animals, rabbits have fragile spines and strong thigh muscles. Because of that, their back and legs have to be supported and restrained, as you see here, when held or picked up, or they can break their spine when kicking back to escape. Gerbils have very thin skin over the tail area, and if picked up by the tail skin, it can literally slip off. Ferrets are such active and busy animals, they won't sit still for long so the handler has to be very patient and allow them to constantly move from arm to arm or shoulder. Also with ferrets, and with most other animals, wake them before reaching in and touching them, otherwise they may bite in surprise. And finally, anyone handling the classroom pet should wash their hands thoroughly after holding or petting the animal. The best precautions against zoonotic disease transmission is to practice good personal hygiene and hand washing along with proper care for the classroom pet. Your teacher's manual has more on proper classroom hygiene such as how to disinfect cages and bowls with a dilute bleach solution. It's also helpful to know what zoonotic diseases may occur as well as those which cannot occur as a result of animals in the classroom unfair burden is often placed on getting diseases from those dirty animals when in fact there's a inherent species barrier there and there are probably more infections or infestations that children are going to get from other children. Um, things that animal diseases that animals cannot be incriminated for include such things as lice as you mentioned, pinworms, uh, viral hepatitis, that would include hepatitis A, B, and C, strep throat, um, and also Shigella. Shigella is a bacteria that frequently is found in daycares and elementary classrooms. It causes a pretty severe watery diarrhea in children, and that is not associated with animals. There are some zoonotic diseases that can come from classroom pets, and there is detailed information on each in your handbook. Many of the common zoonotic diseases that we're concerned about have to deal with the individual pet that may be visiting or residing in the classroom. Uh, we mentioned salmonella and because that can be colonized or infected in every type of animal from a bird to a pocket pet to a dog or a cat or a reptile, we have concerns about that. Uh, salmonella is a bacteria that in the animal you may not show, might, may not observe any signs of illness in an infected animal. If persons contract salmonella bacteria, there's usually a span of one to three days from the time of exposure, which would be that person placing something in their mouth that would be contaminated with the salmonella bacteria, to the time that they would first have symptoms of salmonella disease and those would be mostly abdominal cramping, they may have a mild to moderate fever, but then proceed to diarrhea, and that diarrhea may contain mucus or blood. Uh, 
Unlike it sounds, it is not a worm. Ringworm is actually infection with a fungal organism. And children will get ringworm. It may come from direct animal contact or it may just come from contact with soil. The fungus has spores that reside in the environment and that may be in the soil or it may be on the, the hairs of an animal that's infected with a particular type of fungus. We call those dermatophytes. Um, the animal may or may not show symptoms of that dermatophyte infection in pocket pets such as rabbits, hamsters, guinea pigs. You may see hair loss that may be more generalized or you may see a characteristic circular patch of hair loss. In the person who may become infected with the dermatophyte fungus, the first symptom would be a raised papule or blister type lesion at the spot little red, scaly, and then a progressive circular area of redness, scaliness, and this lesion may also be itchy. Fortunately, it can usually be treated very effectively with a topical cream, but if there is suspicion that a residential pet in the classroom was the source of the infection, it should be brought to the veterinarian and examined for the presence of fungus. Psittacosis is a zoonotic disease of concern with birds and only of, pretty much only of birds. I had to qualify that a little bit because we can have chlamydia psittaci, that's the bacteria that causes psittacosis, also present in goats or sheep or cats. But when we talk about it as a zoonotic infection, usually we're talking about an infected bird as a source. And this is a respiratory infection. Um, birds can shed this bacteria intermittently so you can have a bird that looks relatively healthy but may be shedding the chlamydia psittaci bacteria through its nasal inocular discharges. If a person inhales that they may develop flu-like symptoms, headache, chills, a little bit of a sore throat, a cold and may think that they just have a cold and it may go undetected but there are some persons that that will progress to a severe pneumonia and require hospitalization. For this reason, if a bird is going to be used as a residential pet in the classroom, we recommend that a bird be screened um, using a blood test. If it's a bird that's of a parakeet size or larger, for smaller birds, we would be able to do some serial screening on the stool samples for the presence of the bacteria. there should be a protocol in place of how to manage animal bites. From the health department end, of course, we assess rabies risk with that. There are ant birds, reptiles, um, and small pocket pets are not considered at risk of a rabies exposure, but if we should have a visiting or a residential pet that's a dog or a cat, then that would need to be reported to the local health department and appropriate procedures followed for confinement in a 10-day observation period. This should be less of a concern because our guidelines do require that only pets that are old enough to be immunized against rabies, that is dogs, cats, and ferrets, um, would be those that would be eligible for the rabies immunization be brought into the classroom um, and in the event that we have a resident dog, cat, or ferret, that animal would also have to be up to date on its rabies immunization. And I think these are wonderful outings, especially since our kids now are becoming more urbanized. I grew up on a farm. It wouldn't have been a novel experience for me, but for many of those kids who don't get an opportunity to see a calf or a baby piglet or a horse, um, those are wonderful educational settings but there are some special precautions that should be taken. Um, there are primarily concerns right now surrounding E. coli O157H7 and many of us have heard about that pertaining to food recalls, ground beef recalls, but there are also um, ample opportunities for exposure to E. coli O157H7 from direct contact with infected animals. Usually that is going to be a ruminant animal, particularly cattle. So if they are taking an educational field trip to a farm where there are cattle, um, there are some special precautions that need to be taken. 
Again, this goes back to hygiene. Um, we want to be sure to avoid any contamination with the manure. Um, children should not be allowed to wear sandals or barefoot. They should only go to those types of farm trips with closed shoes. Uh, they should not be allowed to take any food or drink into animal venues where there's going to be direct animal contact. And then following that visit, be sure that all the children wash their hands thoroughly as they exit from there. And then before getting on the bus or the van, check any clothing or shoes for the presence of manure and make sure that that is cleaned. We hope we've been able to give you a feel for how animals can enrich the classroom learning environment and how with some basic understanding of the animal you select, it can be fun, educational, and a safe experience for you, your students, and your classroom head. But as we've mentioned several times, we can only give you highlights in this videotape. For more information, please refer to the handbook that accompanies this tape. Also, ask your local veterinarian. He or she can be a valuable resource for the continuing health care of your classroom pet.